Okay, this is our last module of immunology, the immune response and in infectious diseases. We're going to take a dive into some bacteria, fungus, viruses, and parasites that we sometimes find in the body and how the immune system um, fights them off. So some of the factors that influence the development of infectious diseases include your immune status. Okay, so if somebody is immunocompromised, if he has HIV, or um, a cancer patient who's uh, receiving treatment, they're obviously going to have a hard time fighting off infection. Also, the overall incidence of an organism in the population. Obviously, the advent of vaccines has caused there to be a decline in some of the things, but if the organism is more prevalent, like the flu during flu season, it's going to make you more uh, have a higher chance of getting it. The pathogenicity or the virulence of the agent. Um, things like uh, Ebola, obviously, something like that is very pathogenic and very virulent and can cause a lot of issues. Um, if you get a large enough, enough dose of it, and the portal of entry as well. So did you swallow it? Did you poke yourself with something? All of those things are going to have an impact on how the disease takes over in your body. So in order to develop an infectious disease, the first thing that has to happen is the organism must penetrate the first line of defense. Think of mucous membranes, unbroken skin, um, lysosime in your, you know, saliva and tears and things like that. They have to survive natural and adaptive immunity in order to take over. The first one we're going to look at are the bacterial diseases. Bacteria have to overcome things like phagocytosis from neutrophils and that lysosime that we find in the tears and saliva. We do find that microbes or bacteria can escape phagocytosis if it has a capsule that won't allow it to attach, if it has a cell wall that interferes with digestion, or if it releases some type of exotoxin that is very um, toxic to that phagocytic cell. And sometimes antibodies can overcome those as well. The next one is parasitic diseases. These guys are large. They usually have pretty resistant body walls. They may avoid being phagocytized because of mobility. And the things that we see in the human body to fight off the parasites are immunoglobulins, complement, antibody-dependent cell-mediated cytotoxicity, and then we have those things like eosinophils and T-cells as well. Fungal diseases are usually superficial, meaning that they're on the outside of the body, but they can also be systemic, meaning they can take over the body. They can be common in harmless inhabitants of skin and mucous membranes under normal conditions. And we find that immunosuppressed patients, um, that fungus will become opportunistic and start to take over. Some of the issues with fungus that make it pretty hard to fight off is an antiphagocytic capsule, having resistance to digestion with macrophages, and um, being very destructive of phagocytes. The first fungal one that we're going to look at is candidiasis. A lot of times we see oral candidiasis, which is also called thrush. This looks like a white coating in the mouth or in the mucous membranes. It actually can be a yeast on the skin as well. And when we see this overgrow, there's usually an imbalance of some type or an immunodeficiency. When we see this, especially in the mouth, it's usually infants or denture wearers, people using steroids, or the immunocompromised patients. More commonly, we see genital candidiasis, especially in women. There's itching and burning at the site. Um, about 75% of women have experienced this in their lifetime. Men can get an itchy rash, and the treatment is usually using fluconazole or some type of antifungal cream. The next fungal disease is a respiratory type, histoplasmosis, caused by histoplasma capsulatum. Now this is acquired by inhaling, inha inhaling spores from dust, bird dropping, soil, etc. Now picture um, somebody cleaning out a chicken coop in some southern dry state. Okay, so you're going in there, you're scraping things up, you get a lot of dust flying. This can be found as a spore in that dried up bird poop, right? So you're breathing in that spore laden dust. That's how it leads to a chronic pulmonary type of issue. We'll see fever, even anemia, leukopenia, and weight loss. In order to diagnose this, we have to isolate it in a culture um, and use some other types of testing um, to find it. The next one is aspergillosis. This one can be an allergic reaction, can be invasive or disseminating. It's usually secondary to another disease. The times that I've seen this, we have a patient that might come into the uh, emergency room, maybe with the flu, 
you know, something like that, and um, or some other bacterial type of infection. They give them a lot of antibiotics, and then all of a sudden they end up with an aspergillus type of infection. It's kind of pretty. This one looks like a little flower under the microscope. The next one is coccidiomycosis. This is also called desert fever, San Joaquin fever, or valley fever. And this is usually pulmonary, but it can be cutaneous or disseminated as well. This one we get from the inhalation of soil or dust as well, and they're the spores of the coccidioides imitis. To do this, we usually do hypersensitivity testing. Um, this is usually the first test to be positive. There's fluorescent antibody testing, isolation by culture, immunodiffusion, latex agglutination, and complement fixation. So there's a lot of different types of tests that we can do for this. The next one is called North American blastomycosis. Now this one, we're kind of fortunate that um, we live in the northern states. I wouldn't say fortunate, maybe unfortunate. But if you're from Minnesota, North Dakota, Wisconsin, uh, northern Michigan, we do see more of this. So um, it looks actually like a snowman under the microscope. You can see it up on the top. If, but if it's not caught early on, it can cause a lot of issues and a lot of times even death. So it causes tumors in the skin, lesions in the lungs, bones, subcutaneous tissue, liver, spleen, and kidneys. Um, we can find it on a wet prep, but immunodiffusion and complement fixation are also going to be um, a method of testing. The next one is cryptococcus caused by cryptococcus neoformans. This one is from pigeons. So it's just like the other bird issues that we saw with the histoplasmosis and things that you inhale that yeast in the dust. It can cause a lot of problems. Now the people that get this are usually immunocompromised, especially AIDS patients. They are very susceptible to this. The next one is sporotrichosis caused by sporothrix shigii. This one takes three forms, lymphatic, and you can kind of see how it's spreading through the lymph nodes in this person's knee. It can be disseminated or respiratory. It starts with a spurotrichotic chancre at the site of the inoculation, which is what you're seeing in this picture. We call it the rose bearers or rose thorns, um, or yeah, thorn bearers, rose bearers type of um, disease because if you scrape, scrape yourself with the rose thorn, it can cause this issue. Um, to diagnose cultures, fluorescent antibody staining techniques, yeast cell, latex particle agglutination. The next one is histoplasmosis. So this one is bird droppings as well. Hypso, histoplasma capsulatum is what causes it. Um, usually very young get it or very old. And immunosuppressed are much more likely to get it. We see fever, chest pains, a non-productive cough, and a lung disease that goes with it, so kind of similar to tuberculosis or emphysema. Next, we'll look at viral diseases. These are kind of creepy to me. So if you look at this picture on the right-hand side, you see this capsid that stores all of the nuclear material, okay? What it does is it plops itself down on top of a cell, and it uses this little spike down underneath it to inject all of its nuclear material into the cell. It then uses that cell's DNA to replicate itself, and then there becomes a viral burst, and all of the new viruses are released from that cell. Now, where this becomes a problem is that your body doesn't recognize that there's viral replication going on in your own cells, so it doesn't destroy those cells. And then it's too late, so then the viral burst happens from that cell, the cell does end up dying, but there's many, many more viruses at that point. Usually you use things like interferon um, or antibodies, macrophages, those are the things our body uses to fight those off. But the thing with viruses too is there's a high mutation rate. We, it, we experience antigenic drift, which is the ability of the viruses to alter their genetic makeup, creating mutant antigens and bypassing the antibody barrier of the host. So they're ch they, they like to change, so they're tricky little buggers. So the flu shot, we have to get a new one every year. Uh, the next one are rickettsial and mycoplasmal diseases. These are organisms that are, are um, kind of between a virus and a bacteria. The rickettsiae, rickettsia are obligatory intracellular organisms with cell walls, and mycoplasma don't have cell walls, but they're capable of extracellular replication. Rickettsia is closer to a virus, okay? They're susceptible to antibiotics. We get them from like ticks, lice, fleas, leeches, things like that. 
Some of the diseases that we think of with rickettsia are typhus or typhoid fever, uh, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, African Tick Bite Fever, or other tick fevers. Mycoplasma is closer to a bacteria. Mycoplasma pneumoniae is a very common one, and this can cause bronchitis, sore throat, headaches, and chills. So when we look at the laboratory testing of these diseases, um, we can do, usually do IgM or IgG testing. Detecting the specific IgM can tell us that there's a primary response to that disease and they're actively ill. Also, if we see the presence of antibody in a single um, serum specimen, it can indicate past contact with the agent. Thus, the presence of antibodies alone cannot be used to accurately diagnose that disease. The procedures for the diagnosis of a recent infection should include an acute and convalescent specimen to see if they're, this is their first exposure or a subsequent exposure. Because if they only have the IgM, they are recently exposed. If they have IgM and IgG, it may be a re-exposure. So why do you get chicken pox just once, but colds many times? Well, when you get sick, your blood cells fight off infection and usually create a memory, right? Well, chicken pox, there's one virus. With colds, there's as many as 200. So until you build up the antibodies for every single cold out there, which is something you'll probably never do, um, you will get another cold. All right, now we're gonna look specifically into some more types of bacteria and um, uh, parasites and things like that. So the first one's gonna be streptococcal infections. Everybody's heard of a strep infection or has had strep throat, right? So streptococcus is a type of gram-positive bacteria. And a lot of you are in uh, microbiology right now, so this isn't foreign to you, but it's caused by streptococcus pyogenes, which is the type, the group A strep. Causes pharyngitis, scarlet fever, impetigo, otitis media, uh, sinusitis, septic arthritis, neonatal septicemia. And if you've ever had strep throat, you know how virulent this is and how painful it can be. And very virulent strains can even cause necrotizing fasciitis, which is also known as flesh-eating bacteria. So you look at this picture off to the right here, it's pretty nasty looking, right? Some of the characteristics, it's a gram-positive cocci. We divide it into zero groups, A through O. So there's group A strep, B strep, C strep, D strep. There's all different kinds of strep. Streptococcus pyogenes is type A and most frequently associated with human infection. I think we've all known somebody who's had strep A, right? So there's two antigens, the R and the M. The M is the major virulence factor that inhibits phagocytosis. So that's what makes it so virulent. We have other extracellular products with strep, streptolysin O. This is the enzyme that will bind, um, is bind to it and cause a hole in the red blood cell membrane. So if you think of streptolysin O, it kind of looks, an O looks kind of like a red blood cell. So uh, if you see disruption of, of that, streptolysin O would cause that. So when we look at those plates in, um, you know, micro that are group A strep positive and you see all that beta hemolysis, you can thank streptolysin O for that. Uh, streptolysin S is responsible for the hemolysis as well, and this disrupt, disrupts the um, RBC membrane. Here's some of that beta hemolysis I was just referring to. A few more include um, hyaluronidase, which is spreading factor. Okay, I think hyaluronidase sounds like mayonnaise, right? So it spreads. Um, the it has four DNases. Okay, sometimes the we have A, B, C, and D that we see. Streptokinase is the enzyme that dissolves clots, and we've got erythrogenic toxin, which is responsible for car scarlet fever. Um, some of the epidemiology of this is it's found in the respiratory fat tract and is always considered a pathogen. It's usually spread by droplets or foodborne or it can be milkborne as well. Signs and symptoms are usually in a young child coughing, fever, vomiting, not eating. Children over three is where we start to see that sore throat and fever. You can get a skin infection okay, called impetigo. You can have uh, cellulitis, which is where the skin gets very warm, red, and tender. Or even scarlet fever. This is a pharyngeal infection that produces erythrogenic toxin, which causes the rash. The rash will begin to peel over the next two weeks. Some of the complications that we see with a strep infection is uh, glomerular nephritis. And we've learned about this before, um, causing the issues with the glomerular basement membrane. We're going to see those red blood cell casts with that. 
rheumatic fever. This is a, a very severe side effect of having a strep infection. So 1% uh, of people that are not treated for strep can have uh, an inflammatory disease that really affects the um, tissue, like the cardiac valves and tissues of the myocardium. We see arthritis, endocarditis, central nervous system um, symptoms, skin lesions, nodules, and the components of the M protein are, res are responsible for this. So again, if you get that strep infection, you kind of want to get that treated. So when we look at the immunological manifestations, um, strep pyogenes produces several antibodies. It contains an antigenic component and produces an antigenic enzyme uh, with each, which may elicit a specific antibody response, which leads us to the anti-streptolysin O test, or ASO. This is where a titer is measured, and an increase will show a recent infection, but it can stay increased for a year. Extremely high titers are of greater diagnostic significance. We can do cultures. Okay, we do throat cultures, blood cultures. Uh, we can do antibodies to those toxins, such as anti-streptolysin O, and we can compare the acute and convalescent serum specimens collected three weeks apart. Another side effect is the streptococcal toxic shock syndrome. This can produce the exotoxin A or B. The exotoxins cause a fever and can induce shock, and the M protein evades phagocytosis. So again, it's very difficult to fight off yourself. We see it most often in young children and sometimes older adults, and it can be shock, fever, rash, or infected skin and pain. We confirm this with a group A strep um, test, and we look for the anti-streptolysin O, and we can do a DNA B to see if this is the scenario as well. A lot of penicillin or other beta-lactam antibiotics. Another type of strep is the group B strep. This is the one that the moms can potentially pass off to the babies during childbirth. In this case, they test moms, and if the mom is positive for group B strep, they treat the mom during labor and delivery to make sure they don't pass it on to the baby. This can cause things like meningitis and other infections within the baby. Uh, some of the testing that we use is rapid latex agglutination for the anti-streptolysin O. Okay, so that's a fairly straightforward. We've done those in the lab before. All right, our next one is C. diff or Clostridium difficile. This is a gram-positive spore-forming bacteria, which it can be found in the as a normal human intestinal bug. Now what happens is if you're in a hospital setting for long periods of time, taking long-term antibiotics, things like that, um, it can cause a severe um, type of infection that can lead to a very watery diarrhea scenario. The organ is very, organism is very resilient and we see spores with it. Spirochetes are our next classifications. These are cute. They look like little um, spirals. I think they like the spiral mac and cheese with these. First one is syphilis. Syphilis is caused by a spirochete form of bacteria called Treponema pallidum. Penicillin is usually the drug of treatment for this. It is considered a venereal disease and it can be transmitted um, via the placenta to the fetus as well. So some of the signs and symptoms are usually, um, once you're exposed, there's an incubation period of three weeks but can range from 10 to 90 days. Primary syphilis is the development of a shanker usually on the genitals, um, and it's usually just a, sh a single shanker, as you can see in this picture. It goes away. Secondary syphilis is within two to eight weeks after the appearance of the shanker. You get a headache, sore throat, some nasal drainage, um, you may just think you have a cold. And then you may have some sores on your hands, as you can see here, and you may be like, did I hurt myself? I don't know what happened. Um, and it'll go away, okay? then. And two to four years later, secondary syphilis signs can reoccur, and um, it can even come up in tertiary syphilis about three to ten years later, where the central nervous system is affected. So when this happens, they start to think you're a little bit crazy. So um, we found that you know people in the nursing home sometimes they, they seem to be losing their mind. They draw the blood. Actually, they've got tertiary syphilis that was left untreated. So there's two classes of antigens that have been recognized, specific and nonspecific. The nonspecific are called reagent antibodies. So when we test somebody's serum for 
um, syphilis. We're not testing for syphilis itself, but the protein called Reagan. We can also do two types of antibodies. So the non-treponemals, the VDRL, and the RPR, which is the rapid plasma reagent I just mentioned. And there's a treponemal specific, which is the fluorescent treponemal antibody test, the second one listed here. VDRL is traditionally done on spinal fluid. RPR is done on the blood. Okay, so here's that VDRL done on spinal fluid. RPR, a flocculation test done on serum. FTA-ABS is a confirmatory test. So if you have a positive RPR or VDRL, the, this is the test that's done to verify that, yes, in fact, you do have a syphilis infection. This is kind of fun. These are some famous people who actually died of syphilis. So Christopher Columbus, um, he was born in 1451 in Italy, and he um, was believed that the spread of syphilis across the globe was probably sparked by him and his crew. He became infected with it and later died. George Washington died as a result of syphilis. It's believed that he had syphilis um, and he died because of it, but there's no medical evidence to back that up. Napoleon, he was born in 1769. He was the first ruler of the Bonaparte dynasty. Um, he too suffered from syphilis and probably died due to consumption of arsenic, which was used to treat the syphilis. So if the syphilis didn't kill you, the arsenic probably would. Franz Schubert, Okay, he's a, um, a musician of the 19th century, and he had battled syphilis since 1822. His health, you know, his health started to deteriorate. The cause of his death was the consumption of mercury, which was used to treat syphilis. So if syphilis didn't kill you, arsenic or mercury probably did because they tried to treat you with it. So interesting trivia, right? All right, Lyme's disease is next. This is also a spirochete. So this one is caused by the spirochete called Borrelia burgdorferi. It's transmitted by ixodid ticks, including I. scapularis, I. pacificus, I. Uh, racinus, and I. persulcatus. It's transmitted from the gut of the tick to the human skin, and we see this bullseye-type rash called erythema migrans. So you can see on the right here. So... With Lyme's disease, it accounts for 95% of all reported cases in the U.S. Now, this is a picture from 2008. I encourage you to look at the um, CDC website for 2017. You will be shocked at how much of the top of the United States in our area would be solid blue at this point. So 60 to 80 percent of patients have a skin lesion. Okay, that brings them to the doctor sometimes if you're, you know, educated with Lyme's disease. You'll have some flu-like symptoms, but you can get skin, nervous system, heart, and joint issues. First stage lasts about four weeks. You know, you can have that erythema migrans, have the flu, right around that tick bite is where you're going to see the, that um, bullseye rash. And stage two follows a variable latent period. We see nervous system, heart, eyes, and skin issues, and years, weeks to years after infection is where we get the arthritis to set in. We have late neurological complications as well, so that's where things become kind of sad that um, if it's not treated right away, it can lead to a lot of issues. All right, so um, we can do a culture for the Borrelia burgdorferi, and there's also an antibody response that we can look for. And this kind of cracks me up. How do you prevent getting Lyme's disease? Tuck your pants in your socks. All right, the next one is H. pylori. This is a bacteria, and there's actually a really interesting story behind this. So there's this guy by the name of Barry Marshall in the early 80s, and he was trying to prove to the world that there was a bacteria that can cause um, ulcers in the stomach. And people said, you know what, Barry, you're absolutely crazy. There is no way that a bacteria can live in the stomach because it's stomach acid and it's got a pH of almost 1. Nothing can survive in there. It's like, that's not true. There is. So he drank a whole beaker full of... Um, the H. pylori, got himself a tremendously sick, took a whole bunch of penicillin and treating, treated himself, and earned a Nobel Peace Prize. So um, it hasn't been around that long, you know, like 30 years or so, um, since this was discovered, but it was uh, an amazing discovery at that. So half of the world population um, is seen to have H. pylori at some point. About three quarters of it are asymptomatic, but it can cause those stomach ulcers. It's also associated with stomach cancer. There's urease, which is an enzyme that cleaves the stomach urea to produce ammonia and CO2. 
that ammonia could damage the epithelial cells um, when this issue arrives, arises. So we can do some invasive testing where they go down into your stomach with a scope, take a little piece of your stomach out and do a rapid urease test on it. There's also a carbon urea test which relies on bacterial urease. Okay? There's stool testing we can do, and now the best part is there's serological testing that we can do. We look for IgG antibodies in people's serum to see if they may potentially have an H. pylori infection. Next, we'll look at some of these tick-borne diseases. We already talked about Lyme's disease, but um, so we'll go through this here quickly. And then toxoplasmosis is our last one. So this is a disease in humans and animals caused by the parasite Toxoplasma gondii. Uh, the epidemiology of this is it's from the house cat. If you've ever been pregnant before or known someone who has, they've had to stay away from cat litter boxes because the oocysts from the toxoplasmosis are found in the feces of um, cat litter. So this can be contracted by fecal contamination or food or soil, um, soiled hands, undercooked or infected meat, and raw milk. All mammals, including humans, can actually transmit this through the placenta. And the unfortunate part is that it can cause a lot of um, damage with the baby, the congenital infections, but it can also cause issues um, with, you know, it's like having mono or chills, fever, headache, lymphadenopathy, extreme fatigue. Immunocompromised patients are more susceptible, such as AIDS patients. We do the IgG and IgM with these, and antibodies can be determined within two weeks after infection. Um, IgM indicates active infection, just like other things that we look at. Uh, we can do a monocyte cell culture, but the more common ways are indirect fluorescent antibodies, ELISA, or PCR for this. And this is what Toxoplasma gondii looks like under the microscope. It's kind of a little crescent-shaped um, organism with a little solid piece in the middle. So that concludes our lecture for Module 10.